Now, our first speaker today is Dr. Kelsey Shakuma Lee. She's a committed alum of JABSOM. Uh, we're also fortunate to have both Kelsey and her mother, Cecilia, on the faculty of JABSOM. That's really special to me. Now, Kelsey's topic is one um, of significance for us because we've all been wondering where our hormones went and whether we should try to get them back and whether that was a good idea or not. Uh, so please welcome Kelsey. Okay, great. Well, really nice to be here. Yeah, so obviously this um, topic is near and dear to me because I love the hormones. I'm an endocrinologist. Um, so, you know, you do get a lot of different changes in aging. Um, and some of them, you know, we know something about and some of them we don't know anything about or we think we know a little bit, but maybe not as much as we should. So um, today we're going to talk about a couple things. Do they actually change? And the answer is yes. And then we'll go over some of them. I think some that are really like hot topics that you see on um, TV. You get inundated with uh, commercials on the radio or, um, you know, you're seeing it on the Internet when you look around or even a lot of books on these. So thyroid is one of those big ones. So we do get a lot of thyroid changes with aging. Um, we'll talk about some supplements, and I think one that's been brought up to me a lot is DHEA and how it can make you younger and see if that's really true by studies or not. Um, I added in this part about menopause because I was told actually most of us today are, in, are female, so and a little bit of menopause. We'll talk about that too. Sorry, that's not in your handout. So that's a new part I added in. And then I think a really big topic in the last like five years is low T or low testosterone levels and what that really means. Is that significant or is it? And then we'll have some time for some questions after. So, you know, do they really change with aging? So yes, it's definitely that they change. And I think what's really important here is to distinguish, is that change good? as a result of natural aging, or is it something connected to illnesses? For example, you know, a lot of us get high blood pressure, heart problems, are our hormones changing because of that? Or are the hormones themselves changing and then causing these things? That's what we're really looking at. So how do we define normal? And unfortunately, in terms of studies and endocrine follow-up, the only real system and very short period of time that we have really good data on is actually right around the perimenopausal transition. And so even like a long time post-menopause, we don't have as much information about that. And for other things like mm, the thyroid that we talk about, testosterone in particular, we're just starting to even look at those things. So a lot of it is mostly a little bit unsure, so not so easy to predict. Um, so just to talk about the thyroid. So the thyroid is this bow tie shaped gland. It sits right at the base of your neck. So right above the collar bone. Um, weighs about maybe like 20 grams if you took it out and held it in your hand. And it's about the size of your thumb put together in like two little V's, the bottom of your neck. And it does grow a little bit with age, so that's normal. It actually becomes a little bit more lumpy bumpy as well, that's also normal. And then the things that it really does that's important is produces thyroid hormone. And so when you're um, going to the doctor or you're looking or reading online um, or in books, the two hormones that it really produces are T4, which is thyroxine, and T3, which is uh, trithyrodine. So um, the T4 is actually what most of the is produced by the thyroid, but it's actually an inactive hormone. It doesn't do anything actively in our body. What happens with the thyroid hormone is that it actually gets converted in our muscles, in our liver, in our kidneys, into T3. So T3 is actually the active component. So that's what we're, um, we're looking at when we're looking at thyroid hormone if we have enough. So it's actually quite common to have changes as we get older. And so a couple places control the production of the thyroid hormone. So right in the brain, right in the middle of your brain, Behind your eyes, there's a hormone gland called the pituitary. And that pituitary gland releases another hormone that's called thyroid stimulating hormone, or TSH. And the TSH then signals your thyroid to make those two thyroid hormones, the T4 and the T3. So it mostly makes T4, like 80% of what your thyroid makes is T4, and it makes less than 20% T3. 
So um, when you're taking your supplements, like if anyone has hypothyroidism and you're on a medicine called levothyroxine, that's actually what T4 is. So you're taking a direct supplement of what hormone you're actually taking. So the, when your um, thyroid hormone, your T4 levels are low, that's what we would consider hypothyroidism or low thyroid. When your T4 levels are elevated, that's what we would consider hyperthyroidism. So the body is pretty smart. When your thyroid hormone levels go up really high, it'll actually signal back to that pituitary gland in the brain and it'll tell your stimulating hormone, that TSH, to go down. So it's gonna tell your brain, hey, you have plenty of thyroid hormone around, you better stop telling me to make more. So your TSH will actually go down. And so those will kind of, it will look a little bit the opposite. Right? So your TSH and hypothyroidism will actually be high because your brain is telling, t- trying to tell your body to make more. But if you, don't, if you have too much, your TSH will actually be low because your um, brain is telling your body you don't need any more. So, you know, it's actually pretty common. So I think Oprah is a good example of like, we see it all in the media a lot. Everyone has hypothyroidism. She kept telling us that, you know, it was making her really gain a lot of weight and it was causing her all these problems. You know, it is not that uncommon. It's maybe up to around 5% of people in the US have hypothyroidism. Um, It's more common in women, usually. And even hyperthyroidism is not that uncommon. The range is a little bit greater here. Maybe you're on one and a half percent, up to like 5% of people in the population can have high thyroid too. And the symptoms, unfortunately, are a little bit hard to differentiate from just feeling sick in general. So a lot of people will just feel tired. Um, If you're hypothyroid or low thyroid, you can have weight gain. You can feel cold all the time. You can have some hair loss. Um, You'll have maybe a low sex drive. You can actually not be able to think as well. Okay, and if the opposite, you can think of hyperthyroidism as that you're kind of um, extra turned on, so everything is a little bit up, so your heart can beat really fast, you can have shaking and tremors, um, you can have a little bit of weight loss, um, you'll have maybe itching on the skin or feeling like you're having sweats all the time. So those kind of things can be signals of thyroid disease. I think, unfortunately, because those symptoms are not terribly unusual for a lot of different diseases or hormone changes, they actually overlap a lot. And so um, a lot of times we, if we have these things, it's not a bad idea to get checked for your thyroid hormone, but we do rely a lot on the thyroid hormone test to tell us, you know, are we really in a good range or not? Okay. And, you know, there's a lot of data out there. It's like, oh, I should get a thyroid panel and they're going to check me for, you know, 10 different things. And I really need to have all these 10 things checked. Um, But, you know, in reality, the body is pretty smart. So your thyroid stimulating hormone that we were talking about from the brain, that TSH, is actually 100 times more sensitive to pick up anything wrong with your thyroid than checking a pure thyroid hormone level. So if you go to the doctor and you're worried about your thyroid hormone and they check a TSH and it's normal, um, the the vast, vast majority of the time, you're going to have an otherwise normal thyroid function. Because if anything was changing there, it's going to change 100 times faster than your other thyroid hormones are going to change. The other thing that you can have checked or that if people are worried about is that thyroid peroxidase antibody. So that's one of the things that we checked to see if it's like a marker of if you have any underlying autoimmune thyroid disease. So a lot of us, particularly in Hawaii, we're of Asian descent or Filipino descent, and actually um, that population, we have a little bit more thyroid disease we tend to have. And we actually will have this antibody. But having the antibody doesn't 100% mean that you're going to develop thyroid disease. It just means that you have this antibody. So when you're looking at the population, if you're looking at like a yearly conversion rate, how many of us will actually develop either hyper or hypothyroidism over the course of a year, if I have positive antibodies, it's still pretty low, only about maybe 1% to 4% a year. So it's something kind of of interest, but can't really tell me if I'm actually going to develop something. I might have antibodies and nothing will ever happen to me for my entire life. So just something to kind of keep in mind. Um, And the thyroglobulin that they always keep 
just I feel like on a lot of um, books or internet, they're like, oh, you should check your thyroglobulin. If it's high, that's really worrisome. You know, actually, if you have a lumpy, bumpy thyroid, which most of us do, I would say maybe 70 to 75 of us will develop nodules in our thyroid or irregular thyroid gland, your thyroglobulin will actually naturally become higher. It doesn't necessarily mean that you have anything going wrong inside. Okay? So... Oh, okay. So TSH, I think, really is the best screening test here. Okay. And then, um, you know, when you're checking your TSH, particularly as we get older and as our bodies change, it doesn't always necessarily mean that my thyroid hormone is low. So if I've unfortunately gained weight myself, too, over the course of, you know, time. Your TSH will actually rise, and that's actually just a function of the weight gain and not necessarily a function of your thyroid production. So your TSH will actually naturally go up. So the upper limits of, like, a normal range would probably be in around four and a half. Um, so when you're a young person, let's say you're in your mid-20s, your TSH might be closer to around one to two, or, um, you know, maybe up to two and a half. And then as we get older, it actually tends to get higher. And as we gain weight, it'll actually get higher. So if you have a body mass index that's high, your TSH will actually be higher. It can be over five, and that's totally normal. And the same thing with age, where they actually did a very interesting study, I thought, in 2012, where they actually took a group of people over the population, just a population study of people who felt very healthy, didn't have any thyroid symptoms, and otherwise had no known thyroid problems. And they checked all their thyroid hormones. And so these were people who were age 75 and older, and they split them up by age range. And so you can kind of see for that 97th percentile, right, these numbers keep going up. So these are people who are otherwise completely normal. So by the time you're over 80 to 90, your TSH might normally be around 8 or maybe even slightly higher. Okay, so 6 to 8, which is outside of that, what we would quote unquote call a normal range when our doctor is checking our blood tests, that actually might be completely normal. And even more interesting, I thought, is that when they did these studies and they looked at who lived the longest, when they looked at you know, these TSH levels, actually, the higher your TSH was, the longer you live, okay? So, so don't try to be taking the thyroid home and thinking, oh, it's gonna keep me young. Actually, if your TSH is naturally rising, those, people live, those are the people who are living out to 100 and over, okay? And the reason that we think that might be is that you can kind of think of TSH as a, as a metabolic regulator. It's helping to you know, regulate your temperature, your heart rate, your weight a little bit. So as we're getting older, it's actually slowing down a little bit. It's not pushing our body to make all these you know, really crazy hormones, making our heart beat really fast. It's actually slowing us down a little bit. So it's actually a preservative. Okay, so <laughs> that's the way I like to think about it. So when I'm like, you know what, that's fine. I want my TSH to be a little bit higher when I'm older. That means I'm gonna live longer. Okay, um, you know, the caveat to that obviously is that if you have really, really high TSH levels, and I would say high is like over like 10 to 20, okay, then that usually means that something else is going on. And you might want to take some thyroid hormone supplement because it has been shown to help with preventing like cardiovascular disease. But anything under 10, that actually hasn't been shown to be true. Okay, and then this one, this is a question I get a lot. I have a lot of people um, coming to me being like, oh, I saw this like commercial on TV or my magazine told me I should buy this DHEA because it's gonna make me feel great and I'm gonna be younger and more youthful and energetic and you know, it's, it's kind of expensive though. <laughs> and then I go, mm, well, let's talk about it, okay? So DHEA is actually, it is one of the most common circulating hormones in the body. It's actually a precursor for your sex hormones. So your precursor for your estrogen and your androgens is like testosterone. Okay. Um, and the concentrations do decrease. So one of the reasons they say, oh, you know, maybe this could be an answer for us to feeling more young is because once we hit about 30, it does start to go down. And that's a natural phenomenon. Okay. Um, so it's actually produced 
by your adrenal glands, which are these two hormone glands that sit right on top of either one of your kidneys. Okay, and it actually represents over 50% of your circulating androgen or testosterone production if you are a woman who's premenopausal or in that kind of um, perimenopausal range. So we don't, women don't have the testicles to make testosterone, so most of our testosterone production is actually from your androgens or your adrenals. Um, and it can actually represent a portion of your androgen production or testosterone production in men as well as we age. And so it is highest when you're in your 30s and declines about 20 to 30% by the time you reach your 80s. Okay. And so, you know, the things that made us really excited about this when we first started looking at it was that we did all these studies, right, in cute mice first. And we're like, man, these mice look great. They lose weight. They have less diabetes. They don't have cancer. They had less heart disease. They even, like, resisted um, diseases better, like, um, to bacteria when we tried to, like, infect them. Um, and, you know, when we look at just population studies of relatively healthy elderly people, we're like, you know, your DHS is way higher than this other guy who's not as healthy. So we're thinking, hey, if we replace that, maybe we can have all these beneficial side effects too. Okay, so we tried it. So we're trying it. But unfortunately, mice didn't turn out to be that similar to us. Okay, so the pros were that most people actually did feel a little bit better. Um, you had a, because it's a pro-hormone for your sex hormones, you did have a little bit of extra benefit in, in better libido and your sexual thoughts. Um, it did help a little bit in maintaining your bone minerals, so preventing osteoporosis. Okay, the downsides, though, were that it increased um, kind of some of the mania or kind of irritability could make worse. It did cause palpitations or your heart to beat funny or strangely in some people. And then it actually lowered your good cholesterol, which is a protective effect against cardiovascular disease or heart disease. So those were all bad things. And then the other studies to look at, you know, things like, um, you know, your body composition, like the diabetes, those were all plus minus. Some studies say it helped a little bit. Some studies say it didn't do anything. Some studies say it made it worse. So the things that we don't really know about or if it helps with the mood or anxiety, if it really does increase your muscle mass or your lean body mass, um, if it really does help your diabetes. And I think one of the things that is really important here is that there's not a clear association with steroid sensitive cancers. So if you had breast cancer, which is an estrogen sensitive disease or something like that, we don't know if it could make it worse. So I think that's one of the major downsides. So before we take it, it's like, you know, it sounded really great, but at least so far, no convincing evidence yet that it's really going to help. Um, the people that maybe it could help was that if you had your adrenals removed when you were younger for some reason, and you're not able to make any of this hormone, then, you know, that might be some place where it would help. But otherwise, in normal, healthy people, we don't have any strong recommendations for that. Okay, and then so menopause. So menopause is actually the one area right around perimenopause is what we actually have some good data on. So I'm sure a lot of people have heard of the Women's Health Initiative, where we actually followed um, women for over 15 years. So, um, you know, when we're looking at these studies, we can act, we've um, done population studies now on what we kind of saw around this time. And so typical symptoms that we see during the change in menopause are the hot flashes that everyone talks about. You can get vaginal dryness. You can definitely have sleep disturbance. Uh, it can change your mood quite a bit. And there are other things that we don't know quite if they're really related to the estrogen or hormone changes. It's things like joint pain, which a lot of women say that, you know, I feel that more after menopause, or cognitive changes, like I feel like my memory is not as good, I can't multitask as well after I went through menopause. So those things that we looked at, we're not sure if that's really connected to that or not. Okay, so the hot flashes, the vaginal dryness, the sleep, those are actually pretty common. So over 80% of women will have those hot flash symptoms, and they last usually, I was on average, for at least a year. Um, most people, it will be gone by about four to five years. But if you're still having hot flashes when you're in your 80s or anything else, okay, 9% of the population will still have it. Okay, so you're not, you're not alone. 
Okay, so you can still have persistent symptoms for almost your entire life, unfortunately. Okay, um, the vaginal dryness that you can feel, and maybe even like the decreased sexual interest sometimes from that vaginal dryness is actually because the vagina and your urethral tract is actually estrogen sensitive tissues. So the estrogen helps produce some of the lubricant, it helps with the blood flow. So when your estrogen levels decrease after menopause, those things will get drier, maybe more um, painful or difficult to have intercourse. And then as a result, both of the hot flashes and just separately, the estrogen actually has um, receptors in your brain. So those will actually cause sleep disturbances. So almost half of women will have some kind of sleep disturbance, either from the hot flashes or just from these estrogen changes. And then actually feeling blue or not feeling your best is quite normal as well. Um, Maybe two and a half times more common right around the perimenopausal area or time to start having more depressive symptoms. And then we actually think this is kind of due to your fluctuating hormones. You had a higher estrogen level, now you're dipping down. And it's not going to go away overnight. It's kind of going up and down okay, during like a few year period. So the average time that women would go through menopause would be around age 51. Um, but, you know, it's obviously very different depending on your mother, you know, other health factors and things like that. So it can be a range. So those are all things that you know, can happen. Uh, there are some positives, though. So over 70% of women, you know, when, um, after we go through puberty and onwards through our, most of our adult life, we're having periods. It's giving us headaches. Okay, over 70% of women have menstrual-related migraines or some kind of headache, breast tenderness, um, mood swings, and irritability. So those things will actually go away. So that's kind of nice. Um, your, if you have any problem in your uterus, such as fibroids, which might have caused like pain in your abdomen or excessive bleeding, they're actually estrogen sensitive fibrous tumors as well. So those will actually shrink after menopause and can cause you less problems. So that's a bonus. Um, the negatives though is that pretty much all of us will lose bone mass pretty rapidly. So osteoporosis becomes much more common um, after menopause. We do see an increase in our risk for cardiovascular disease. As part of that, our good cholesterol, that LDL, um, I'm sorry, sorry, the good cholesterol, your HDL, will actually go down, and your bad cholesterol, the LDL actually goes up a little bit, and that's pretty typical, which might be why we have a little more cardiovascular disease. After menopause, we do lose a little bit of our muscle mass and our lean body mass, so we can gain some weight afterward. Um, Like I was saying, you have estrogen receptors all around your brain, and it interacts with your neurons and the nerve transmission hormones, so you actually can see impaired balance does affect the skin as well. So you can have um, a decrease in kind of your skin elasticity or like your collagen in your skin. So you might feel like your skin is like, you know, less, um, kind of less moist, less, more dry. Um, So what can we do to kind of either change some of these things? Well, actually exercise is a huge one. That can actually decrease the menopausal symptoms when we've done trials on it and just Things that make common sense, if we kind of dress smart, we're having hot flashes, okay, we're gonna, we're gonna wear the tank top today instead. Okay, keep cool. Some women do have triggers from certain things like spicy foods. Um, increased stress is gonna make all of these symptoms worse. Um, when they look at supplements and things, there's a couple of them that look like they might help a little bit, like low doses of vitamin E. We um, tend to not suggest like taking really high doses, just because they've also found that high dose vitamin E can cause other problems like blood thinning. It was associated actually with increased death risk if you went really, really high, okay? Um, They've had classes that people do on biofeedback where we go and we try to think about minimizing our symptoms and those have actually helped as well. Um, 
any time that we get weight loss, it can actually make these symptoms worse too. Or, I'm sorry, weight gain. So weight loss really does help as well. And then there are other um, medication therapies that have been shown to be beneficial, like some antidepressants, like serotonin reuptake inhibitors, or some nerve pain medications like gabapentin. And then obviously, I think the big one that you know we've all heard about, or if it's um, you know, is this going to be a good thing for me? Is actually hormone replacement therapy. So estrogen and progesterone, well, we are losing it, right? So if I give it back to myself, is that going to make all of these things better? Um, so it comes in a variety of formulations. You can have estrogen-only products, or you can have estrogen and progestin products. And they come in oral pills. They come in um, skin patches or gels or sprays. Um, they also come as injectables, so you can get, like, once to twice weekly estrogen injections, or they actually come as also vaginal um, tablets or creams or actually um, intravaginal rings that you can place that will release hormones slowly. So it comes in a variety of different um, formulations. So I think the real thing is here is that, is it worth it? So when um, we had this big women's health initiative trial, the thing that came out of it that really scared a lot of people initially was that when we took all of the data together, it actually looked like hormone replacement therapy made everything worse. Um, people were dying earlier, they had more cardiovascular disease, they had higher risk of clots, and so everyone started to stop taking it. And you know, there was actually like a fall off in hormone replacement, almost like 20, 40 percent of people who were taking it before stopped it because of that study. But we've had a number of years to kind of analyze that data a little bit more closely and then do some follow-up studies. And I think there's some really interesting kind of distinctions when you're looking at this. So if you look at this graph, um, on the um, right-hand side for the benefits, so if it's kind of a moving out on this side, it means that it was good. It did something good for you. And on the left side, it's risky, so it means if I took it, it actually in increased my risk of having something bad happen. Okay, and the blue bars are if I took estrogen only, and then the orangey yellow bars are if I took a pill or a patch that had estrogen plus progesterone. And um, so if you look at this, when they took it as a composite, so everything together without separating these groups, you actually had an increased risk overall for cardiovascular disease. But when you actually look at when they break it down, so the blue bar with estrogen only, it was actually a beneficial effect. So if I took an estrogen only pill, I actually had less of a risk of having heart disease. I had less of a risk of having breast cancer. Hmm. But if you had progestin in your, in your um, medication, that actually changed. Then I was more likely to develop something. Okay. Um, when we look at blood clots, so things like blood clots in my legs or blood clots in my lungs, unfortunately all of those didn't matter what you were on, either estrogen only or estrogen plus progesterone, they both made me have an increased risk of having clots. Okay. Um, but when you look down further, um, we have, if you're on estrogen only, you had less of a risk for lung cancer. If you were taking any kind of hormonal therapy, my risk of osteoporosis and fracture was much less. Okay. Um, and then actually, when they separate out, um, you know, all-cause mortality was a little bit better. And then you're like, hmm, but... Dr. Shkuma just told me that everyone was dying. Well, yes, that was true when they looked at the first time until they separated out this particular age group. So it was age 50 to 59. So women who were in their first 10 years after they actually went through the menopausal transition. So the women that had a worse outcome from taking the hormonal replacement therapy were those that were 10 years out from going through menopause. So if you started hormone replacement therapy right around the time that you went through menopause and you continued it out, your risk was actually better. So it's just the, old, like if the older that you get, the farther away from you not having any hormones that were normally getting produced, that was where that increased risk came from. Okay. So I think that's 
really important. So then you're going to say, well, what's safe for me? Because you have this group of population that said it got worse for them if I was over 60. And then if I'm 50, maybe it was better for me. But, you know, overall, if I continue it out after 60, does that going to mean that I'm going to have an increased heart risk? Well, I think that um, data we still maybe don't have that good a handle on. The suggestion is that, no, if you start it right around the time of menopause, you actually might be safe from this. Um, but we don't have, you know, 40, 50 year studies that really tell us that data. So what's recommended by the Endocrine Society, okay, is that you actually do two things. You go to the, um, your regular doctor and you can calculate your heart risks, so your underlying heart risks. So if you go online, actually, it's a, there's a cardiovascular risk calculator, and it takes like your age, your gender, your blood pressure, and your cholesterol levels, and it'll give you a 10-year risk of, if, of how high you have of developing some kind of heart problem. And then um, you take that percentage, and then you look at the number of years that you are out from menopause. And if you're less than five years, if you have a low cardiovascular risk on this score, we think that the medical hormonal therapy, that's what MHT stands for, okay, we think it's okay for you. We think it's good. Um, if you've got a moderate risk, we say we still think it's okay for you, but we recommend you to take um, the transdermal form of estrogen or estrogen plus progestin. And the reason for that is that the transdermal means patch, so patch or gel on the skin. And as opposed to taking like a oral contraceptive pill, oral, oral estrogen pill. And so the reason that we think it's better to do the patch is actually when we've done studies, when you use the patch on the skin, the medication gets absorbed into the body, but doesn't get processed through the stomach and the liver like it does when you swallow a pill. So the liver is the place that makes a lot of our clotting factors. A lot of the things that um, when we're um, worried about like stroke or um, blood clots in our legs, if you have increased clotting factors, that can make that worse. So when you're taking the oral pill, that really changes that liver production of your clotting factors. But if you take the patch, it bypasses the liver, so you don't have as high as risk. So that's why we say, okay, if you're going to do it, you're going to choose the patch. Um, if you have very high already cardiovascular risk, then you know, we tell you, because we don't have these long-term outcomes trials, um, you should probably avoid it. We're not going to take that risk of making something worse. Yeah. Okay. okay, and then this one I think is a really big topic. I'm sure most people have heard a lot of commercials on TV or radio about low testosterone, um, or I, and I like to call it andropause, like the men equivalent to menopause. Okay, and what it is, is like a constellation of your symptoms of having low testosterone, and you have documented low blood levels of testosterone, but we can't find anything wrong when we're looking at your brain or your gonads or anything else in your body that might be causing that. So the problem here is that if your testosterone is low, but we can't find any reason for that, well, why would that be? Is your testosterone low and then it's causing you to have health problems and that's why you're not feeling so good? Or do you already have health problems and then that's what's causing your testosterone to be low? So it's kind of like a chicken or an egg kind of problem. We don't know which one came first. Okay. So it does cause a lot of things. Uh, you can see like decrease in your strength or your muscle mass. It can also predispose you to osteoporosis, so your bone mineral density can be lower, um, can make you feel less energetic, your sex drive might be lower, um, it does increase your risk for developing diabetes, it can make you feel just not as good, your mood is worse, more tired. Okay. And then same thing, just like estrogen, if you have a lower testosterone level, it could change your cognitive function. People don't feel like they can think as well. And then it also is associated, when we've done epidemiologic studies looking at populations, that if you have a very low testosterone level, that is associated with increased mortality or increased death rate. Okay. So very similar to all of the other hormones, um, the testosterone is actually controlled by sex hormones that get produced in the pituitary again in the brain. So the sex hormones in the brain are called LH and FSH. 
and they signal to mostly your testicles to produce that testosterone. And then again, if you have um, too much testosterone around, it's going to go back to your brain and kind of turn down these brain hormones to tell the rest of your body, hey, you don't need to make any more testosterone. Um, we're good here. So it's kind of that circular pattern. So we're looking in both those places to see if there's anything wrong with your testosterone, both your brain and then your gonads, your testicle. Okay. So um, when testosterone gets produced, it actually gets produced in a cyclic pattern. So it goes up in the morning and then it actually goes down in the afternoon, and then it'll slowly rise up again in the very early morning hours. So actually, one of the things that's a good indicator that your testosterone is sufficient is actually if you have a morning erection. So spontaneous morning erection happens also at least part because your testosterone is rising in the morning. So here's the problem with this. If I, as your doctor, tell you, you know, I'm worried that you might have low testosterone, come and do a blood test for me, but you come at 3 o'clock in the afternoon and draw your blood, and then it comes back low, well, I'm not going to know what to do with that. Everybody's low at that time. Okay? So they're gonna, you're going to be like, oh my gosh, I'm low, this is terrible. And then actually it's just normal. Okay? So if you're going to check your testosterone, you have to do it on an empty stomach right in the morning after you wake up in the first couple hours. Okay? And then you can kind of see that um, this is not anything that changes with age both in young and older men, you're going to have this cyclic production of testosterone. And it does, though, change with aging how much testosterone you're actually making. So this is just a chart on um, the horizontal bar. It just shows your age kind of going up. And then on the vertical bar, it just shows how many people um, will develop like testosterone that we might consider low. And so you can kind of see that it does increase with age. So it's actually like a normal phenomenon. Everybody's testosterone, even if you're otherwise healthy, as you get older, your testosterone is going to be lower. It, not, it might not necessarily go really, really low, okay, but it will be lower. And in fact, when they've done population studies, um, a lower limit for a young man might be like around like the 300s. A lower limit for when you're 70s or older might be in like the 180s, okay. When People look at um, blood tests that we just do in the lab, and we're kind of giving you what a normal range is. Most of the time, a cutoff is going to be around the range of 250. Okay. So I think this is a, sorry, it's a, it's a little complicated, busy slide, but I think it's a really important one. So remember how we talked about the symptoms of having low testosterone, and a lot of things were things like mood, I don't feel like I can lift as much. I don't have as much muscle mass and things like that. Okay, so um, some very smart people published a study in the New England Journal of Medicine, which is one of our best um, journals, and they looked at these sexual symptoms, they looked at physical symptoms, and they looked at like your mood and psychological symptoms, and then they tried to correlate them with if you actually had a low testosterone or not. And so this horizontal line Anything below it means that your testosterone was low. The horizontal line, anything above it, means that your testosterone was normal. Okay? And the vertical line here, um, the closer these little dots are to the vertical line, that's how much they correlated with you actually having a low or high level of testosterone. So the closer it was to that vertical line, it means that it seemed like it was connected together. Okay, and then the open circled or open squares or triangles, those are if you didn't have any symptoms, and then the ones that are colored in are if you did have symptoms. Okay, so you can kind of see right on the bottom here, this only one that is low are these colored in red squares, triangles, and circles. And so what did that actually correlate with? So that actually correlated with the sexual symptoms. So decreased frequency of your morning erections, if you had erectile dysfunction, or if you had low sexual thoughts. Those are what actually correlated with you having a low testosterone level when we checked your blood. Um, if you told me you were tired, if you told me that you were depressed, if you told me that you couldn't lift as much, if you told me you couldn't walk as far, those had nothing to do with your testosterone level at all. 
Okay, so if so, when people are coming and saying, you know, you, do you feel tired? You might have low testosterone. Actually, maybe not. Might have nothing to do. So what you should really be asking yourself is, do is my sex drive low? Um, do I not have as many spontaneous erections? Do I not have sexual interest? And those are the things that are actually going to be correlated with having low testosterone. Unfortunately, we're all hardworking people. We get tired. <laughs> <laughs> so everyone's tired. So I think this was a very really important study. Um, okay, um, and you know other things besides, mm, you know, having just um, these symptoms are going to affect your testosterone levels. So there are other things that you can do to naturally bring them up. So if you are, for example, overweight, they did studies looking at your testosterone levels, and when they check your total testosterone levels, they were actually low. And then we thought, oh, you know, this is bad. Is it, are you gaining weight because your testosterone is low? So what they actually did was they tried to separate out if that was really the case. And so they drew some um, blood studies, like from your muscle, in your cells, and they drew like what we call free testosterone. So what's actually active in the body. And when they drew the active testosterone levels, even if you were overweight, normal and overweight people also had normal activity of the testosterone at a cellular level. So even though we drew your blood and it looked like it was low, your body's pretty smart, it's still actually taking care of business at a cell level. So things that you can do to naturally raise your testosterone level is actually lose weight. So same thing with diabetes. If you had uncontrolled diabetes or any other uncontrolled health problems, those naturally made your testosterone lower. If you lost weight, you brought down your blood sugars, those actually made it better. So this slide just shows on um, the vertical line here is how much your testosterone increased. And this horizontal line here is how much body weight that you lost. Okay, and then you can kind of see the more body weight I lost if I was overweight, my testosterone levels went up. Okay, and that's without giving you any other type of treatment. So one of the main treatments you can do for yourself is weight loss. And, you know, we do also, though, we do care, I mean, if we can't find anything wrong, why, why do we even care about testosterone? Well, it's because when we do population studies, we um, see that if you have a normal testosterone, um, you live the longest. And so this horizontal line here is just your testosterone level, so 2 would be low and 10 would be extra high. And then... Um, these uh, vertical lines are kind of your risk, what percent of the population um, was having either health problems or dying early. And so you can see if you're dying on these upper parts, you either had a very low testosterone or you had actually a very high one. So you actually don't want to be either. You really want to be in this kind of sweet spot in the middle. Okay? You want to be in the normal range. And so if you're going to be looking to see if, if I actually do have low testosterone. You want to do that morning blood test, and you want to do it at least twice just to make sure that it was real. Um, and you want to make sure you rule out other causes. So if I did, you know, gain too much weight, or if my diabetes is not under control, um, something else is going on, if I can fix those things, I might be able to fix my testosterone. And when we target our replacement hormone, we usually only target like a low normal range. So that would be around like 300 to 400. A normal range, like if you're going to the lab, would be around 250 to 800. So we're not trying to make you Superman. We're just trying to kind of get you to that low normal range, okay? Um, and you know, the people who would be candidates for therapy are things like we talked about, that you've already done all these things. You tried to lose weight, you tried to control your diabetes, you got treatment for um, some other things that could affect your testosterone, like sleep apnea. Sleep apnea can actually make your testosterone lower. Um, you know, if we can fix any of things with lifestyle changes, it's more effective than me giving you medication. So if you've done all those things, then we can th talk about therapy. Um, so therapy does come in a variety of different forms. So you can have a gel or a patch that you can um, put on your skin. You can get injections, which are usually about once every two weeks. Um, they do have oral testosterone, although we don't generally use it in the U.S. because it has a higher risk of liver toxicity. Um, they also have testosterone that you can kind of put in your cheek and get absorbed through the cheek mucus. Um, that they have, and they also have implantable pellets that we just put under your skin and it will slowly um, give you testosterone, usually throughout like about a year. 
And so this is just a very busy slide, but what I just wanted to show is that we do actually have a lot of studies looking to see if like me replacing your testosterone is really doing anything. So we're looking at all these different things, like is it making you feel better? Is it making you skinnier? Is it improving your mood? Is it improving your quality of life? Does it give you increased risk of cancer? We're looking at all these things. So There's a lot of different studies, but there's only a couple bottom lines that we've actually found. It can improve your lean body mass, so your body composition will get better. In most of the studies that we had, your sex drive will improve. Um, the improvement in your sex drive, I think this is a really important point, that if your main problem is not that you don't feel interested in sex, it's that you're actually having erection problems, you're not able to have an erection, the testosterone is not gonna help you there. It's really actually the sex drive. So your libido is what it's gonna help with, not with the erections. The erections is probably due to something else, like a blood flow problem or a vascular problem. So even if I make your testosterone high, it's not all of a sudden gonna give you great erections, okay? And then almost 100% of people, they will have an increase in their hematocrit, or it's, that's your red blood cell concentration. So basically your blood does become thicker so testosterone actually used to be an old treatment for anemia. We would give it to you if we wanted to increase your red blood cell count. So the reason this is important is because if you have thick blood, the things that it can increase risk-wise is heart attack, stroke, blood clots. Okay? So if you have a very high red blood cell count, it actually does also correlate with decrease in your life. So that's a big deal. Right? We don't want to cause problems. So those are the only two benefits, okay? Improved body composition and libido, that's the only ones that we found consistently. Everything else, mood, quality of life, hasn't been shown. It's about 50-50 for all of them. Okay, the potential harmful effects, things that we're not quite sure about, prostate cancer, because the prostate cancer is usually testosterone sensitive, we could potentially make that worse. Although in studies we really haven't shown like an increased rate. Um, it can increase the size of your prostate. So if you have urinary tract problems, like you have a problem using the restroom, that can make it worse. Um, testosterone actually also has receptors in the brain, so it can actually also worsen sleep apnea if you have sleep apnea problems. It's sort of like being a teenager again, you're getting an extra boost in your hormones. Your testosterone so it can cause acne, oily skin, can cause joint aches. We talked about the elevation in your red blood cell count. Um, and then there's some things that we just don't really have a good handle on yet that we think it might decrease your good cholesterol. And we actually think that it might increase your risk for heart disease too. But we don't have a lot of good studies, but I'll talk about one. Okay, so this was a really interesting study that they did in Boston. It was called the Boston's Men's Aging Trial, and they took men who were over age 75, and half of them, they gave them fake testosterone, so it was placebo, and half of them, they actually gave testosterone. And they followed these men for nine months, but they only treated them either with testosterone or with placebo for six months. Um, and then they looked at what happened. So the testosterone that they gold was about 500. So remember how I told you a normal range of about 250 to 800? So they gold about 500. So they weren't golding like very high levels. Okay, they were kind of going that mid-normal range. Um, and I think the scary thing to me about this study was that they actually ended up stopping it early because of risk to the patients. Okay, so this horizontal line here is just the months since they started treatment. This vertical line here is the probability of having a cardiovascular event, so having something bad related to your heart happen. And the red line here is those patients that were on testosterone therapy, and the black line is those patients who were just taking fake medication. And you can kind of see that um, those people who are on testosterone, you had a lot higher risk of having a cardiovascular event. That risk was actually pretty significant. When they did the FALP study, it was almost 33% higher. You had a 33% higher chance of having something cardiovascular happen while you're on testosterone. Okay, and I think the more worrisome thing to me is that you can see, I told you that they stopped the medicine at six months. 
Um, but so that means from six months to nine months, they weren't taking anything. But the people who were on testosterone before, their risk still kept going up. So we did something there maybe. We maybe turned something on that we shouldn't have with that hormone therapy. So I think that can be, you know, that's a real concern to me as a physician, obviously. I don't want to cause anybody harm. Um, okay, the, the big caveat and but to this, okay, is that they stopped this study early because they saw this. So they didn't power the study enough with enough people to tell me if this was a real finding, is this truly an effect, or is this just we had a really unlucky run, that first population of people that we studied, and it's just chance that this happened to those people. So we don't know. We don't know if this is a real effect or if it's actually something that's there. So they're doing long-term studies all across the country now to kind of figure out if this is true. But right now, I cannot tell you if this is really true or not. But it does give me pause, right? It's something that's like, ooh, you know, that's a big risk um, for like the benefit of having increased sex drive. It really depends on, you know, what, what you're looking for to get from your testosterone treatment. Okay, so I think contraindications, so think reasons you might not want to get testosterone therapy is if you have a history of prostate or breast cancer already, if you already have bad urinary problems, um, if you already have that high um, red blood cell count that's going to make um, you at higher risk, if you aren't treating your sleep apnea, because remember I told you it can make it worse, okay, if you already have heart problems, I probably tell you to stay away from it because we don't have good data regarding if it's going to help or not. And then the prostate or the PSA is a prostate um, antigen that we measure as like a risk of prostate cancer. So if you already have high risk, then you know, we're not going to probably give it to you because we don't want to make that risk worse. Okay. And then um, same thing again, like I was saying before, we don't have a great follow-up studies for people on testosterone, so we don't know what the optimal length of treatment is. We don't know like, if we should continue it forever or we should only give it to you for a couple of years, right? So um, we don't have any clear goals for success. So if it's making you feel better, you know, that's, that's wonderful. I'm going to keep giving it to you. But, you know, if you take it and you don't feel any improvement, you're not feeling that your sex drive is better, you're not feeling that you, um, you know, your energy level or anything is better, then you know, I'll probably treat you for six months to a year to make sure that you had a good trial, make sure that it doesn't help you, but if you still feel the same at the end of that time, I'm, I'm going to stop it. Because what's the point of me giving you a medication that you know, might be causing you harm and isn't making you feel any better? Okay, So you do want to get followed up regularly, um, to check those things that we talked about, your symptoms, your prostate, your red blood cell count level, and then obviously you don't want to get too low or too high, so your testosterone level. So, yeah. And that's all I've got today. So, any questions? Thank you, Kelsey. <laughs>